In this lecture, shock two, we're going to take the concepts that we learned in shock one and extrapolate them to vasopressor activity. That is, what you pick to fix what's broken. So let's put the equation back up there again and also the model for the tank and the brain. Let's start off with the mean arterial pressure, cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume is preload times contractility. The tank model has three areas of dysfunction. The brain always suspended from the top, never has enough volume to get there. You either have a dysfunction of systemic vascular resistance making the tank too big, a leaky tank where you don't have enough volume, or the pump is broken. This was systemic vascular resistance, this was preload, and this was contractility and heart rate. The tank, the fluid, and the pump. As you begin to approach vasopressors, you should see them in four different categories. Really three, but there's four because these are medications that we infuse that affect blood pressure medications. Let's go over that first and then we'll kind of pull them back into these models. There are four classifications, general classifications that you should think of. The first one is pure vasoconstrictors. These provide vasoconstriction and that's it. These are purely SVR. There are inotropes. They're called inotropes, but I call them inoconstrictors. Being an inotrope, it provides some contractility and provides some vasoconstriction. The third classification, and you'll see why I call it inoconstrictor, is inodilator. An inodilator is going to provide lots of contractility. But being a dilator is actually going to drop systemic vascular resistance. You'll see why this makes sense in a little bit. The fourth classification of blood pressure infused medicine is the pure vasodilator. Now we're talking about shock, not hypertensive emergency, so we're obviously not going to talk about the vasodilators but they are the calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and nitrates that require constant infusion to bring the blood pressure down. This is your cardine drip, your esmolol drip, and your uh, nitroprusside or nitroglycerin drips. We're not talking about vasodilators now. All we're talking about the different types of shock. The vasoconstrictors, when you hear these words, I want you to think vasoconstriction. That is phenylephrine, vasopressin, and epinephrine. Now I'll pause for a minute and say that every one of these medications has some degree of inotropic activity and some sort of vasoconstrictor activity. And you are going to see tables in textbooks that say plus one, two plus, three plus, alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. You will never remember that. And it will not help you reach for the next vasopressor that's the correct one. Which is why I don't do it that way. Vasoconstrictors think phenylephrine, vasopressin, and epinephrine. For the inoconstrictors, there are two. Levofed and dopamine. And the way I draw them... is a little off-center. Both of these can act as potent vasoconstrictors, 
both of these have some inotropic activity. But levofed is more of an inotrope and less of a vasoconstrictor than dopamine. Now, if you learned about dopamine, you learned that there were three classifications. At doses of one to five micrograms per kilo, you get D1 receptor activity, which equals renal. Between five and 10 mics per kg, you are getting primarily beta, and that's inotropic. And at 10 to 20 mics per kg, that's alpha, and that was a constrictor. Right, that's in pharmacology class, it's really cute. This turns out to be false altogether. There's no such thing as a renal dosing. All it does is increase diuresis, not increase perfusion to the kidneys. In that they, these numbers don't correlate very well with real life. And as you tell a nurse to use dopamine, she's gonna keep going up until the blood pressure gets better. So really what dopamine is, is a constrictor. Yes, it has inotropic activity, especially at lower doses, but primarily, Dopamine is more of a vasoconstrictor than levofed. Levofed has a little bit more inotropic activity. The nuances don't matter. They're discussed so that when someone comes back at you, and if you're using this model, you know what they're talking about. But in reality, dopamine equals levofed, except in the setting of sepsis, because someone did a study that said dopamine causes more tachyarrhythmias than levofed. So, from right now, if you have to pick a vasopressor and you don't know what's going on, the safest one to pick is levofed because it's somewhat inotropic, it's somewhat vasoconstrictor, and so far in any of the trials, it's been shown to be the safest. What you'll see the most of is septic shock, and levofed is the best in septic shock. So a lot to do about the difference between dopamine and levofed, but really they're the same, except in sepsis, pick levofed. The NO dilators are going to be dobutamine and milrinone. Now I want you to see these as different classes of medications. The NO dilators, and we'll talk more about this in CHF2, that is admission or CHF to the intensive care unit, but in CHF, there is too much vasoconstriction, too much afterload, and not enough systolic WAMP. Ideally, these medications are going to improve the inotropic activity and dilate the periphery. So they're going to reduce afterload and give cardiac output support. These medications are ideal for CHF. The inoconstrictors, levofed and dopamine, provide both inotropic activity as well as vasoconstrictor support. These medications are ideal in sepsis. The systemic vascular resistance pure vasoconstrictors, only all they do is vasoconstrict. And so they are ideal in conditions that are pure systemic vascular resistance, other than sepsis. So any of the causes of systemic vascular resistance, you're going to use one of these. If it's sepsis, use levofed or dopamine, which is not surprising. You probably learned in first year medical school, and if you have anaphylaxis, you give the person epinephrine, saying the same thing in a different model. So let's see what this means in relation to our two models. If you have pure vasoconstrictor defects and you want just a pure vasoconstrictor, you're going to give phenylephrine, vasopressin, or epinephrine. Unless it's sepsis, in which case you pick levo or dopamine. If it's a contractility issue, you give the inner inotropic support with dobutamine or milrinone. But wait, what about preload and heart rate? There isn't a constrictor for one of those. No kidding. If the problem is cardiac output, the systemic vascular resistance is going to respond by going up. 
You don't want to give a vasoconstrictor, a vasopressor, if the body is already increasing systemic vascular resistance, which is why we give the inodilators for, for CHF. The body has CO down. Cardiac output's fallen for any reason. It will respond naturally by increasing systemic vascular resistance. That's bad only in the setting of heart failure, CCHF2. If the problem is systemic vascular resistance, the cardiac output will increase and we have to give back tone. We have to give, use vasopressors to increase systemic vascular resistance. So what then do we do when they're in shock and have a problem with their heart rate? That should be obvious. You fix the rate. And as we learned in the first video, that either means shocking fast rhythms or pacing slow ones. And if they have problems with preload, what do you do? You give them preload. And then remove the obstruction. So if you have diagnosed someone with a GI bleed, they have massive hemorrhage and they're in shock, which presser do you pick? None of them. They have already increased systemic vascular resistance. They need blood. Their volume down. Their preload is down. Giving them a vasopressor is only going to do what the body's already doing. So if you haven't got it from that standpoint, let's go back over to the other model, the tank model, and fill this in again. If you have problems with systemic vascular resistance, you are going to use the vasoconstrictors to replace systemic vascular resistance. Vaso, epi, and phenylephrine. Unless it's sepsis, then you pick levo or dopa. I'll give you a highlight to shock three. If you are going into septic shock, you are going to pick levo first and follow up with vaso. It's evidence-based. It's not logical. You don't get there any other way than reading the papers. If there is an issue with preload, what you give is preload. Either intravenous fluids or blood. Which fluids you give, albumin, normal saline, D5W, half normal saline, lactator ringers, is going to be dependent on the particular condition. But you're going to give some preload to support the preload and then remove the obstruction if one exists. And for issues with contractility and the heart rate, you're either going to support the contractility with dobutamine or milrinone and fix the rate by either shocking them or pacing them. Now as a little caveat, and again we'll get into more of this in CHF, if you say I want to put someone on dobutamine and they're in shock, the nurses know that that is going to decrease their blood pressure and they'll say they're already below blood pressure, what do I do if it goes even lower? Your response should be, I've diagnosed them as having a contractility issue and the inotropic support should fix it. But this is not evidence-based and this is only from expert opinion in the hospital where I've trained. If you need to give another medication to support systemic vascular resistance because the vasodilation is too strong, you pick one of those inoconstrictors. So it will not be surprising to see someone on a CHF service on dobutamine and dopamine, or milrinone and phenylephrine. The idea being that you're giving the inotropic support with dobutamine or milrinone, and their vasodilation side effects are too potent, so you pick a vasoconstrictor. All right, in shock two, we've started to explore the different kinds of vasopressors. I want you separating them into three categories. Pure vasoconstrictors, the inoconstrictors and the inodilators. They each have their own purpose. But I also want you to recognize that you only infuse a medication in two conditions, systemic vascular resistance or contractility. And that should be your major decision point, which one is broken. Otherwise, you use electricity to fix the heart rate or simply give them volume. And in most cases, you're going to do multiple things at once. Give them volume while assessing what else they need. So I wanted you to visit again the model, the, both the equation and the tank model, 
and now to engage it in a way that uses the medications you're going to infuse in the ICU. In shock three, we're going to talk about sepsis and assessing the response to your therapy and trying to figure out when you need to start considering something else. That is shock two. We make these videos for free and we need your help. Please donate because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.